together The climate is dope and stuck in a wonderful fucking feed Oh yeah, there's something awesome and incredible That only he will get the glory A God is dope and stuck in a wonderful incredible and awesome The God is dope and stuck in a wonderful Jesus joy. 
and you work, worshiping with us for the first time here at the First Baptist Church in Chesterfield. If the Lord places it on your heart, come back and join us and be part of our faith family. We know we'll be all the more better because of your precious spirit. So we invite you to do just that. Welcome to the First Baptist Church of Chesterfield, where we are trusting God for more. Welcome. God is doing something wonderful in me. Come on, say, God is doing something wonderful in me. Something awesome and incredible. And only He will get the glory. God is doing something wonderful, incredible, and awesome. God is doing something wonderful. Come on, let's give God some praise in the building. You may be seated. You may be seated.
But we're celebrating Jesus on today. Thank God for sending Jesus. Hallelujah. There is no Christmas without Jesus. Look at your neighbor. Tell your neighbor. There is no Christmas without Jesus. I know what you did last night. And I know what you're going to do when you leave here. Give those presents and turn those lights on. But if it wasn't for Jesus, I need some help in the room. I need some help in the room. Come on, somebody. Somebody. String instruments. High sounding cymbal. Somebody ought to give God some praise this morning. Don't leave it hanging. Hallelujah. He has come. He has come. Let heaven and earth rejoice. The Lord has come. Joy to the world. A little different kind of way, y'all. But if you don't mind, just put your hands together like this. Come on.
to dancing because some of us <clears throat> cannot sing. All right, y'all. Places, everyone. Places. Hit it. It's all good, even it's all good, good.
angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconcile. Joyful all ye nations rise. Join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim. Christ is born in Bethlehem. I'm preaching right now. Hark! The herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. This is December 25th, Christmas Day, isn't it? Glory to the newborn king. Hark! The herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Eternal God, our Father, Master, we sit and stand in your presence this day. And Lord, right here and right now, we thank you for sending your Son, Christ our Lord, who was born in Bethlehem. And Lord God, our reality is he had to be born in order to die. And right now, Master, we just thank you for your prevailing love, for your grace, for your mercy. And Master, on this day, we celebrate the one who is our King. So in this experience, Father, continue to rest your little bite in us. And right now, hide us behind the cross that your word may be magnified, that the body of Christ be edified, and Lord God, that you be glorified. For all we do is to that end. It is in Christ Jesus' name we pray and ask it all for the sake of the church and kingdom building. Let every heart say, Amen. Amen. We certainly reverence the Spirit of God in this place, and we're thankful to be here on this day. A special day in which uh, is important to the life of the believer. The day in which we celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful this morning that not only are we here and, and present in person and online, but we have experienced wonderful worship. I just want to thank uh, not only our music ministry, you can go on and clap and say amen, amen, amen. We thank our music ministry. We thank Miss Clarissa Grissom for blessing us this morning. Amen. One of our own has come back home. We thank our, our praise team, our youth, Essence and Leilani and Grace and Aubrey. And of course, my man Noah representing. God is certainly good. God is certainly great. God is certainly worthy of our praise. And I'm thankful for you online family who have joined us. We thank God for you. But I'm thankful for those of you who got up this morning and decided to hold off on the Christmas presents just to come out to the house of worship. We're going to all be over there packing this afternoon, but thank you for being here today. And it's because of you I really was going to preach a 15-minute message. I told some few people this week we're going to have a 15-minute message. And I thought about it. I said, you know, I don't want anybody upset with me for coming out all this way for 15 minutes. So we'll see what the Lord has to say about that. Amen. Why don't you journey with me uh, to the gospel recorded by Matthew. Gospel recorded by Matthew, the second chapter. We're going to share today verses 1 through 12 as we celebrate the birth of our King. Gospel of Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Reading today from the English Standard Version. Uh, thankful today for all of our guests who are with us, for the families who are joining families today, for all of our college students who are back home. Uh, just we thank and praise God for each and every one of you. I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm going to recognize you uh, after the uh, message, after our invitation once again. Gospel of Matthew, 2nd chapter, verses 1 through 12. Reading from the English Standard Version. Join me on the screens. The other words are found. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, 
wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among rulers of Judah. For, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. They departed to their own country by another way. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord this morning. Family, this morning I want to talk with you for a moment, our time together from the thought, the way to worship the king. The way to worship the king. I shared with you, I gave you a sneak peek on last week uh, about the illustration here this morning I'm going to share. Uh, imagine you are at a birthday party, not just any birthday party, it's your birthday party. You have been thrown a surprise party, you have been thrown a party that was supposed to be a surprise but you found out about it. So you've been excited about it for some time now. And uh, you get to the party, the people are coming, the place is packed, people are excited about uh, celebrating you. But then you notice that as people are laughing and talking and sharing gifts, nothing is coming your way. People are laughing and mingling and enjoying themselves and eating good food and, and watering the throats. But yet, all the while, you stand in the corner kind of ignored. It is your party. Uh, the party was given for you. The party was given because of you, because this is the day that is your birthday. But yet, everybody is getting something but you. This scenario takes place every Christmas. As people are caught up in the Christmas spirit. Jesus Christ is often left out of the celebrations. It has even become offensive to wish somebody Merry Christmas. Happy Holidays is now the politically correct statement to make. As Santa Claus, Christmas trees, shopping sprees, family get-togethers, and football games consume our attention, some have lost the real meaning of Christmas. So I probe in question this morning for you family and friends. Uh, what is the real meaning of Christmas? What is the real meaning of Christmas? And I would tell you today, and it's confirmed and affirmed in the word of God, Christmas is a call to worship. Christmas is a call to worship. Theologian and author A.W. Tozer wrote, Jesus was born of a virgin, suffered under Pontius Pilate, died on the cross, and rose from the grave to make worshipers out of rebels. Christmas is a call to worship. The Gospel of Mark proclaims Jesus to be the Messiah King 
in fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy. The validity of this claim is established in the opening chapters of Matthew's gospel. Matthew 1, the fact that Jesus is Messiah is affirmed by the nature of his birth. Jesus was born into the world lineage of David, which is the point of genealogy in Matthew 1, 1 through 17. Moreover, Jesus is the, the son of God. Matthew 1, 18 through 23 establishes the divine nature of Christ's birth by declaring the miracle of a virgin birth in fulfillment of prophecy. Isaiah 7, 14 says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. In Matthew 2, 1 through 12, that we just read to you, we find the messianic credentials of Jesus affirmed by the response to his birth. In this pericope of scripture, Matthew reports that the birth of Jesus was not just an important event in the history of Israel. It, it also captured the attention of the world. Even the stars above spotlighted the birth of the one whose life, death, and resurrection would change, emphatically change the world. So, I'll say it again for your hearing, the proper response to the birth of Jesus is to worship him as king. This narrative is not about the birth of Jesus. It is about what happened after the birth of Jesus. We do not know how long after the birth of Jesus these events took place, but it was at least a year after his birth. Verse 11 tells us that Mary is in a house, not a barn or an inn. It also tells that Jesus is a child, not a baby in a manger. The only thing we know for sure is that the time of these events is that it was in the days of King. Herod. Verse 1 says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem. Legend, tradition, and hymnody tells us a lot about these wise men that cannot be verified. Scripture does not say it was three wise men. And it does not say that they were kings. The term wise men translates a Greek term which we get our English word magic or magician, which is why we uh, call them sometimes uh, the magi, which indicates these dignitaries were really astronomers who were experts at reading the stars. More important than who the wise men were, were where they were from. They were from the east. These non-Jewish dignitaries traveled a great distance to meet Israel's king. So impressive that this caravan of dignitaries, uh, it was so impressive to Herod that he gave them a royal audience. Thinking they must have come to establish a peace treaty an alliance with him. Family, we can't be so full of ourselves that we think everything that happens in and around our lives is about us. So he asked for the purpose of their visit. And they answered, uh, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. God supernaturally drew these wise men from the east of Jerusalem to worship King Jesus. And God is calling you and I today to worship King Jesus. Verse 2 reports that the wise men came to Jerusalem with a question. Where is he who was born king of the Jews? But it is not wise for these wise men to come before a king 
who took the throne by force, who had the support of the Roman Empire, who earned a reputation for treachery, it's not wise to ask, where is the real king? That's what they were saying. Yeah, well, we see you here, but where is the real king? Yet they were more determined to find the righteous true king than they were afraid of the ruthless, treacherous king. That tells us, family, today that we can't be so caught up and concerned about what we see before us when in actuality we know who holds us. So no matter where we are, what we do, we ought to be saying, where is the true king? Show me the king. They had to find Jesus. And this ought to be the question that guides and governs your life today. Where is he who was born king of the Jews? Luke 2 records the only biblical account of the boyhood of Jesus. Just 12 years old, Jesus accompanied his family to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast of the Passover. When the feast was over, the family was headed back home to Nazareth, assuming that uh, everybody was there in the caravan in which they were traveling. They had traveled a whole day before it was acknowledged that Jesus was not with them. We go about our journey assuming Jesus is with us, but in actuality, sometimes, family, even we have left him behind. Where is Jesus in your life today? Have you put your trust in him as your Savior and Lord? How are things between you and the God you serve? How are things, if you had to do a checkup this morning, relational checkup, how are things between you and Jesus the Christ? Every person on the side of my voice is a worshiper. Everybody online, everybody in the building, everybody listening, is a, it is a worshiper. But your God is whatever you give most of your attention to. Some worship their work. Some worship money. Some worship the things they can buy with money. It's kind of quiet up in here this morning. Some worship family. Some worship pleasure. But everyone is a worshiper. It's inevitable. But you must answer the question, what do you worship? Who do you worship? Where do you worship? The issue is not if you will worship. It is who or what you will worship. In his book, Real Worship, Warren Risby writes, God and Satan have this in common. Each desires our worship. God wants our worship. God wants us to worship him because he is worthy and graciously wants to transform us. Satan wants our worship because he wants to destroy us. And worship is the easiest way to achieve that diabolical purpose. Who do you worship? God is calling you to pursue life's most important mission and that is to worship his holy and righteous name is my mic working this morning oh, yeah. oh man okay okay i want to make sure here we go but in verses three through eight it tells us how foolish men responded to the birth of jesus verse three says when herod the king heard this he was troubled and all jerusalem with him in 40 B.C., the Roman Senate voted to appoint Herod as king of Israel on their behalf. Herod was a throne by military force and reigned until his death in 4 A.D. He was a treacherous ruler who held on to his power at any cost. To show you how far this man went, uh, he even killed his wife, killed his sons, and killed his brothers so that there would, there would be no threat to his authority. Augustus Caesar reportedly said that it was better to be Herod's dog 
than to be his son. How do you think Herod responded when the wise men asked to meet the real king, the newborn king? Verse 3 says he was troubled. And all of Jerusalem was troubled with him. One troubled man troubled a whole city. That kind of reminds me of some of our political places today in our world. One, one troubled man can trouble a city, a town, the country. Here it is. Herod was troubled by two words. Born king. Jesus was not elected. Jesus was not the appointed king. Jesus did not become king by force. Jesus was born king. For Isaiah 9, 6 and 7 says, For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This is a threat to the powers that be. The spirit of Herod, unfortunately, is not dead. The world is threatened by the name Jesus. That's why, church, we got to call every chance we get Jesus in the morning, Jesus at noonday, Jesus in the evening, because he makes everything all right. Here it is. The world is threatened by this name Jesus, but we must not be ashamed to worship Jesus boldly, publicly, and defiantly. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says, Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. We must worship Jesus no matter what the world may do. The wise men searched for Jesus to worship him. Herod was threatened by Jesus and plotted against him. The religious establishment ignored Jesus and went about business as usual. These ancient responses to Jesus have not changed. And they confront us with an important matter today. What is your response to the name, to the person, to the authority, to the work, to the message of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, family. There are a few ways in which we must worship him. First of all, we must worship him joyfully. We must worship him joyfully. Verse 9 says, As this is the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that had been seen when it arose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. The star led the wise men. The star led them from the east to Jerusalem. Then it seems the star disappeared. But after the wise men met Herod, the star reappeared and led them directly to Jesus. In verse 10 is a parenthetical statement of the response of the wise men to finding Jesus. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great Joy. And family, when we see the signs of Jesus within our own spirits, we must rejoice knowing that hell is on the way. Finally, Jesus made them, these men shout. They did not rejoice in their power, they did not rejoice in their position. They now rejoice in their possession. They rejoiced in finding Jesus. 
And this spiritually intoxicated joy is a rebuke to those who claim to know, love, and trust Jesus, but uh, get excited about everything but Jesus. What if the choir had not shown up today? But we have still been able to worship the newborn king. What if the preacher were somehow impacted on the way to church today? Would we have still been able to worship the newborn king? On your way in the worship space this morning, on your even as you gathered online, was there chatter in your, chatter in your spirit? Was there a noise of joy because you showed up to worship his name? We didn't show up to spectate. We didn't show up for a concert. We didn't show up to get entertained. We came up in this place to give his name glory because God continues to rest through and abide in each one of us. But on this day, he sent his son that you and I might live. My, my shirt says, grace, lest any man should boast. Not because of how good we are, not because of what we've done, but all because we serve a risen Savior. And that alone ought to give us shout and joy to thank God and for who he is and to thank him for what he's done. So we, we, we worship Jesus joyfully. But then we got to worship him reverently. There are three ways to view the Christmas season. Three ways to view the Christmas season. You can view Christmas cynically as if this is about nothing more than spending and making money. Or you can view it graciously, wishing others the best over the holidays and into the new year. You do not have to be spiritual to view Christmas cynically or graciously. There are professing Christians who view Christmas this way. Only the true worshiper can view Christmas reverently. Only those who worship God in spirit and in truth can see that Christmas is about the one born king of the Jews. And this is how the wise men viewed the birth of Jesus. Verse 11 says that going into the house, they saw the child with Mary's mother and fell down and worshiped him. Note, Matthew reports the wise men saw the child first, then Mary, his mother. Joseph is not mentioned at all. This is because the wise men did not come to honor a royal family, they came to worship the newborn king. Some people cannot worship if they are not comfortable. The music got to be right. The preaching, they say, got to be right. The temperature in the room has to be right. The sound got to be adjusted to our personal volume levels. The right people got to be sitting around us for us to get into the spirit of worship. Our list of inconsequential preferences must be fulfilled before we can worship. But this is the direct opposite of biblical worship. In scripture, the whole idea was to get out of our comfort zone that we might truly worship him. So here it is. You cannot seek his face and save your face at the same time. Oh, only one can win. Which face will you focus on? His face or your face? Make a choice today. One or the other, but you can't have both at the same time. Not only must we worship him joyfully and reverently, we got to worship him sacrificially. Amen. Verse 11 again says, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary's mother. They fell down and worship him. Then... Opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The wise men offered Jesus their reverent adoration and their valuable possessions. Are you willing to give it all? Worship and giving go together. Exodus 34, 20, God warned the children of Israel, 
and none shall appear before you empty handed. The wise men came to Jesus bearing gifts. We do not know if it was three wise men. I kind of said that before, but it may have been a caravan of hundreds. But scripture tells us that they brought three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now the first gift was gold. Gold was the medal of royalty. It was the only gift worthy of kings. The wise men gave gold to honor the child as king. And the significance of the second gift is not so obvious because frankincense was presented to priests to offer God sacrificial worship. They were given to priests who would then go in and offer God sacrificial worship. The burning frankincense symbolized the offering of worship going up as a sweet aroma to God. The wise men gave frankincense to acknowledge the child as a priest. Jesus was born to be king of the Jews and our great high priest. Amen. The gift of myrrh is even more mysterious. Myrrh was primarily used to embalm dead bodies. What a strange gift to give a little child. The wise men gave myrrh to foretell the child as savior because Jesus was born to die. Amen. Christmas has no meaning without Good Friday. Someone asked me, well, Pastor, what do you think is more important? Uh, Christmas or Easter? For, for the salvation of the saints, can you have one without the other? We know, though, that without the shedding of the blood, there'd be no remission of sin. But had he not been born this day, the child was born to be our king, lived to be our priest, and died to be our savior. So we gotta worship him joyfully. We gotta worship him reverently. And we gotta worship him sacrificially. But lastly, family, we must worship him obediently. The story of the wise men ends in verse 12. It says, and being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Herod commanded the wise men to inform them when they found the child that he may come and worship him. But Herod had no intention of worshiping. That kind of made me wonder, are there folk that show up on Sunday morning with no intention to worship? I'm letting you think about it. And the prophecy of your own priesthood. Herod commanded the wise men to inform him that they had found a child when they had found a child. He knew he wasn't going to worship him, but he planned to assassinate the child. Matthew 2 and 16 says, Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old and younger, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. The wise men did not know Herod's evil intentions, but the Lord warned them. Note the joy of verse 10 is followed by warning in verse 12. And Jesus was warned in a dream. Not to divorce, Joseph was warned in a dream not to divorce Mary. The wise men were warned in a dream not to return to Herod. Family, pay attention to your dreams. Because God has all kind of ways that he touches us and reaches and talks to us. So always be open and understanding to how God may speak to you. Because literally, it can save your life. They obeyed his warning. And this tells us. Worship. Is not measured. In what you do in worship. Worship is measured by what you do after worship. Worship is not measured. By what you do in worship. Worship is measured. By what you do after worship. 
We enter to do what? Worship. We depart to serve. They go together, but we can't come in and worship. And just say, I'll see you next week. I've done my due for the day. Because God is looking at our hearts and our actions, looking at our beings after the worship is over. Because you know what? You can fool me and I can fool you. But neither one of us can fool God. And so often we get caught up on what we each other see. I don't care what you see. If I'm following the God I serve and what he has called me to do. And you should care what I think if you're following the one who holds us and sustains us. But if we all get on one accord to follow him, we shall and we will be all right. True worship always leads to radical obedience. So it's not about what we do in here, it's about what we do after here. Because true worship leads to radical obedience. If I gotta keep reminding you I'm saved, something's wrong. My walk ought to tell you I'm saved, not my talk. The way I live and move and how I present myself to you ought to tell you I'm saved. The way I handle myself in frustrating times ought to tell you I'm saved. The way we deal with Christ ought to tell you that we're saved. But if I got to keep telling you I'm saved, somebody need to have a meeting. Because it may not be <laughs> what it appears to be. And you got to keep apologizing for the same thing you keep doing where you're really sorry. Press it on. Obedience. True worship is all, always leads to radical obedience. In obedience to the divine warning, the wise men return on their, to, their, to their own country by another way. The simplest way home, the simplest way home, was for them to simply make a U-turn and go back the way they came, just to retrace their steps. But they heeded to the Lord's warning to go home another way. And this way was inevitably out of the way. Yet their worship of the king would not permit them to go home the way they had come. Anybody kind of catch that? And often I say, I pray that you would leave this place a different way from which you came. But when you come in, you ought to leave the worship space a different way in an uplifted mind and heart and spirit. The things that troubled you before ought not trouble you when you leave here. Because whatever is bothering you ought to be laid on the altar. God says, listen, cast your cares on me because I care for you. I'm going to tell you, this is not part of the notes, but I'll tell you, when we joined Chesterfield in 2001, my son Christopher was about two years old. And I like getting to church on time. So in the mornings, we get up and we get ready because we used to sit right up here on the maybe third or fourth row. And you can't walk in church late and come down front. Well, you can do it. But at this point in time, we really didn't, you know, they won't do that. And so I would get frustrated. You know, I say to my wife, why? Why? Why don't y'all get up earlier? Why don't y'all doing this and doing that? And sometimes on the way to church, and I'm testifying, I'm being transparent, I'd be kind of barking. And then I get here, get out the car, all smiles. Good morning, hello, how are you? Praise God, he's, he's I say he's good today. And one said, Lord convicted me. And he didn't say fool, but he might as well say it. If you would get up and help her, right. if you would get up and, and, and have that character, maybe you can be to have what you want to have. But, but, but if you're going to follow me, you have to learn how to follow. And leading is what? Following. We can't come and worship with the wrong mindset and expect to get out of worship what God has intended us for us to get. 
So we have to ensure that on our way to the house of worship, our hearts and minds are clear to be able to give God unadulterated glory and worship and praise. And whatever that means, whatever we must do to condition our minds and hearts, family, we got to do it. Because nothing should inhibit our praise and worship. Nothing should preempt our praise and worship. Nothing should stand in the way of our praise and worship. No issue should be between us and God because we're blocked in our own feelings and our own senses that we can't clearly see the one who's worthy of our praise. Y'all ready to go? 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away, yet behold, all things have become new. A transformation. That transformation comes by metamorphosis, and we can see it, a painted picture of this caterpillar that now turns into a beautiful butterfly. Uh, a butterfly is not simply a caterpillar with wings, but it's gone through a process. And what, what once was ugly and creepy is now something beautiful uh, to the eyes and beautiful to the sky, but it went through a process. And our salvation, our relationship with God ought to manifest itself in this same way to show the world that we've gone through a process. And now because we are with Christ, we are a new creature walking in a new way with a new spirit by a new leader with a new voice, with a new mind, with a new heart, with a new walk, with a new talk, with a new way to go and way to live. The old have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Richard Foster is right. He says, if worship does not change us, it has not been worship. When you worship the king, you ought to go home another way. To God be the glory for what he has done this day. Pray today that you go home another way. I'm not talking about Highway 40. I'm talking about 364. I'm not talking about 270, 44, whatever you travel. I pray that your heart and your mind go home another way. And if you're under the sound of our voice this Christmas day and you want to give your life to Christ, what a perfect time. What a perfect day. To give God your all. As Jesus gave his all for us on the cross. Where he was hung. Where he bled. Where he died. Put in a borrowed tomb. For part of three days. But on the third day morning. Because he was born this day. He got up on the third day. With all power in his hands. And because Jesus got up with all power. Right now. No matter where you are in your sin, you can give him your life and you can get up. So if you're online with us, reach out at 636-537-8748 or email us at salvation at firstbcc.org. And we're going to stand all over the building. If you're in person today and you want to give your life to Christ, you can come now. You can give the deacon or the preacher your hand while you give God your heart and we will walk with you. Every step of the way. Maybe you already know Jesus and you are just out of fellowship with the church. What a beautiful day. Christmas Day 2022. For you and your family to join us in this place. To show that God is still moving. And he's still working. He's connected family today that we might walk and work with one another. Maybe you are saved but you've been out of fellowship. You've you know, gone another way for some time. But today, you can come back home. And home is not FECC. Home is wherever God is and God's people are. So we're here with you today. 
And we offer Christ to you because we want for you what God has willed for your life. We offer Christ to you. Oh, my sister. You can sing with us. He will give you bread. you've come as a gift from God, we won't be the same because of what you'll bring. And God ensures that his church has everything it needs right in the midst of where and who we are. And so we are so excited because we know this is not a one and done. We're excited because you've been prayerful. We're excited because you've been intentional. We're excited because you are excited about being here. And so we're committed to walking with you and working with you and doing everything that God has called us all to do together. So on behalf of First Baptist Chesterfield, I say welcome. Welcome, welcome. So glad to have you. Well, we're glad to be here. 
Um, and what, uh, there was no better day than enjoy today on the, the birth of Christ. Uh, since the first time that we walked into this church, it has been a wonderful feeling of the spirit just being uh, present here. And as we continue to come, uh, my wife and I decided and we prayed about it and we just had uh, such a wonderful feeling that helped us make, uh, make the choice to join. Amen. God bless you. We thank and praise God for you. I'm going to have Deacon Watson and Pastor Crump. They're going to take you out to our conference room. We're going to get some information from you. Uh, but we're excited uh, for to have you. And we know that not only will we not be the same, but guess what? Your lives won't be the same. Because I go here, this is an experience. It's not just worship, it's an experience. And we're going to walk together and work together as God lifts us all up. So God bless you. And look forward to seeing you. God is great to be praised. The honor here, but God is great and he's worthy to be praised. Mark, I, I don't think my mic is up. I, I can hear myself, but they can't, they can't hear me. God is great and he's worthy of Christmas 2022 of our praise. Because we're not here because we're so good. We're not about to walk into 23 because we've been so wonderful. There's folk who started but didn't make it. There's folk with a hospital even right now. But yet God saw fit to allow us to come into his house, to come into his presence, to be in this place on this day. Not because, again, we did anything, but he put breath in our bodies. He put movement in our feet. He put a lifting in our hands. We ought to just say thank you at least for one time. Can somebody say thank you? Can somebody say thank you? Can somebody say thank you? We praise your name. Thank you. We glorify your name. Thank you. We worship your name. Let me tell you something, family. You don't know what folk went through to get here. So I plan on leaving it all here. I don't want to take it back home. I'm going a different way from whence I came. So y'all just think I like acting up and I get emotional. Let me tell you something. I got a phone call last night at 9.13. And I didn't see it because my phone was in my pocket. But I got in the car and after 10 o'clock and I called the number back. It was my daughter saying, Dad, we were in an accident. Can you come pick us up? I said, where are you, Cindy? She said, I'm on 270 and 170. I said, okay, I'm on my way. I got there. She said, we're okay. I got there praying all the way, rejoicing all the way because I just reached a funeral for a family member two weeks ago who got killed in a car accident. Now, in that service, we gave God praise. But I know what the outcome can sometimes be. So I got on the scene and I saw the vehicle and I heard about what happened. When they tell me that cars start sliding and the car that hit them skid off and, and caught on fire. And yet nobody lost a life. I said, well, what, 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 what was my granddaughter doing? And he, she said, well, Dad, she slept through the whole thing. And I said, oh, my God. It reminded me when Peter was in jail, about to be killed, chained between two guards. And the Bible said, but he was asleep. Because Peter said, if God has this, what is it for me to worry? I know he has it. While the people were at Peter's mother's house praying, Peter was asleep. Peter was released from jail and went to his mama's house. They were surprised to see him because while they were praying, God was moving. While you pray right now, God is moving. So you can give him thanks right now because he's already fixed it. You can give him thanks right now because he's already corrected it. You can give him thanks right now because it's already done. It's already done. It's already done. My Bible says it's already done. That's why I praise him. That's why I thank him because he kicks on. Make it away. He keeps on making away. Is he able? Do you know he's able? Have you tried him? Ain't he alright? Can you say yes? Say yes. Say yes. I know he's able. 
give you all the time. Yeah, yeah.